so Guy's going to take us through about 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so, including some questions and answers slots at the end. Uh, so if you do have any questions and answers, feel free to pop them in the chat as we go through. Um, and we will also just open up the lines for the last couple of minutes of the call so that uh, if there are, there are any questions that you, you feel free to to get them to get them answered this morning. Um, but yes, without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to Guy, who's going to take us through uh, a little bit of content all about uh, how you can potentially drive some automation and uh, better set levels of integration within your business and within your business system. So uh, over to you, Guy. Thanks very much. So good morning, everybody. Um, there are some names and some faces that I recognise popping up. Although most of you have now hidden yourself when you found out it was being recorded, so that's fine. We'll just leave it with me. Um, uh, as Michael says, we're looking this morning at um, integration and automation, particularly using our BPA platform. So by way of just a brief agenda, um, a little bit about Coders platforms to start with. Um, then we'll have a little bit on why businesses choose to automate and what automation can do for you. We'll look at a couple of examples and use cases. We'll have a look at a return and investment piece. And then we'll cover what we can integrate with, uh, the functionality and overview of BPA platform itself. And then we'll finish with a little bit around um, something we've done fairly recently, which is the credit hound, uh, sorry, the credit hound alerts pack. Uh, with our friends at Dresa. So Codis Platforms, for those of you that don't know, was established in 1999. Um, so we've got over 20 years of experience. Back then we were called Orbis Software and the product was called Task Center. And it was primarily an alerting and notification tool. So we would drag information from a database, run some rules over it, and allow customers to send out notifications, primarily by email, about different things that they were interested in monitoring within their business, whether that be um, low stock or customers on stock or large orders placed or back orders coming in. Whatever it was that was important, we could generate information and alerts based on that information. Then sometime in the mid 2010s, somebody asked us, well, if you can take data from point A, can you please put it into point B because we've got systems that don't talk to each other? And that's kind of where the integration piece came in. Um, a little bit after that, we changed the name of the product to BPA Platform. Uh, BPA, by the way, stands for Business Process Automation. And we changed the name of the company to Codus Platforms, I think in 2017, to reflect what we were trying to do with the, uh, with the software, which is make it codeless uh, as an experience. We're based in Paul in Dorset, uh, but we sell the software globally. Uh, we've currently got eight and a half thousand or more customers around the world operating through 300 partners. We only operate through accredited partners. We don't operate direct um, as a direct sales model anymore. Uh, and just at the last point there, Innovate are, of course, as you'd expect, fully accredited Codeless Platforms partners. So what is it that drives business to want to automate processes? There are a number of things. Uh, we'll look at these four um, in a little bit more detail. So there are political factors, and it's a really interesting time to be talking about political factors at the moment. Um, when we designed uh, and set up this slideshow, the most predominant political factor that people were considering was Brexit. Um, all of the different challenges that that brings, all the different paperwork that it brings, um, all of the different hurdles that businesses have to go through to get whatever they're trying to do done in, in the workplace. Um, that's somewhat been overtaken recently um, by what I would call growing friction between trading blocks. Um, without wanting to get political, let's leave it there, but things are more difficult now um, and they're going to be more difficult in the future dealing with the eu the us china russia 
the West um, and the East not getting on quite so well. So, you know, there, there, there are all these political factors that, that look to drive automation of processes. Then there's economic. Um, I think that everybody's expecting a bit of a, a, a recession again now. Uh, we're looking at inflation, tax rises, reduced customer spending again. Uh, these are all things that we experienced a couple of years ago when COVID started um, and uh, the, uh, the the situation in Ukraine is now driving those things again. I think the, the, the um, inflation is now the highest it's been for about 30 years. So there are economic pressures on businesses. Um, there are also implications of self-isolation on the availability of labour. Um, that's changed a little bit as people change how they're working. Um, but still, I don't know about you, but a lot of my customers and a lot of the people I deal with haven't been back into the office for two years. Um, and some of them aren't looking to go back at all. That leads into the social side, the COVID-19 side. It did change the way people work, but it also changed the way people consume products. So um, products and services are consumed. People don't go to the shops so much anymore. People That's buy important. more online. We need. So um, it's it, it's it's changed the way that businesses need to present themselves to the marketplace. Um, you know, whether this be social distancing, lockdowns, or just the general movement towards working from home, uh, businesses are having to adapt to the way they're expected to service their customer base. And I guess lastly on this one um, is technology. So people are expecting to do business in different ways now. Uh, not that long ago, you wouldn't expect people to do business from a mobile phone, but that's perfectly possible now. Mobile phones, tablets, laptops, with, th with um, the new infrastructure, things like 5G, um, the rapid advance of technology means that you have to service different ways of interacting with your customer. They expect you to be available 24-7 um, and then to be able to access your services or your products however they want to. Uh, that's also driven the use of e-commerce, obviously, um, and associated technology. E-commerce is probably the biggest boom industry that we've seen from an automation perspective in the last two and a half years as everybody pushes to move their bricks and mortar to an online presence even if they didn't have one before. The other point around um, the business consequence side is that all of these factors have now come in uh, that maybe weren't in people's thinkings before. Uh, people have higher levels of competition, uh, the products and service margins have decreased. Now more business is being conducted online um, and the customer experience is becoming increasingly critical. We, we all know that um, you've got uh, rating systems for almost everything you deal with now. So if you want to buy a product or take a service online, it's been reviewed by somebody somewhere and given a star rating. Uh, and what people are expect expecting now, uh, rightly or wrongly, is an Amazon style experience where they've got the online retailing thing pretty nailed down in terms of the interaction with the customer. So as a customer, you know that they've got your order, you know when it's being picked, it's being packed, it's been placed, it's been shipped, you've got a tracking number. And people expect that sort of interaction with every entity they deal with, whether it's a massive organisation like Amazon or whether it's a tiny one man band operating from a shed. The expectation is much the same. The other thing we've noticed is reducing time to deliver goods. It's no longer acceptable to suggest that when I place an order on a Monday, I'll get that product in the post on a Friday. You know, people like Argos now are offering same day delivery services. Um, so people are looking at automation to speed up their, their, their process, speed up their organization and the way everything works and give them, if even if not differentiation to, diff to, to other manufacturers, at least the same sort of service um, and, and not a reduced service. 
So what sort of things can automation do for companies? Uh, there's two sides to this thing. It's what it can do for the business uh, and what it can do for the customer. In terms of the business, it tends to be things like uh, increasing profit margins. So there's always the money side. So you've got profit margins there, you've got cash flow. Um, but an interesting one is also ensuring industry compliance, um, providing audit trails, things like GDPR, where you have to prove that you have a process for doing things. And if you're completing a GDPR questionnaire, you have a load of tick boxes that you have to say, yes, I do this and this is how I do it. More and more companies are finding that if you automate as many processes as you can, the completion and the and what's more, the proof of adhering to these pr processes is a lot easier because it's all done in a repeatable fashion by a machine rather than somebody doing it manually and it being open to interpretation. So you've got all those sorts of things down the left hand side. Um, one of the, the, the bottom one particularly interesting is increased visibility of critical information. So regardless of what system your, your employees are using within the business, they should have as much access to data as they need to do their job. And on the right hand side, we've got the customer side of things. So as I said, customers are expecting fulfillment 24 seven. They wanna be able to buy whenever they want to buy. They want delivery when they want it delivered. They don't wanna have, they don't want to have to wait until the office is open for updates or other communications. So automation of processes can allow them to interact with your business whenever suits them. Um, and this can lead to improved customer experience, better comms, reduced lead times, and better satisfaction overall, and back to this star rating uh, that you can protect. So if we look at a very basic example process, um, if a customer, we're using e-commerce in this instance, but a customer comes onto your e-commerce site, um, they place an order, that should update the ERP system. You probably then update your warehouse management system. You may place an order with a third party logistic company or a courier or your own, um, uh, your own dispatch team. You'll want to update the customer. You'll want to do some bank reconciliation for the payment that they've made. You'll want to update their details into the CRM. And we go on through with placing orders, pick lists, raising stock, digitizing returns, customer feedback and monitoring. Now, that's a fairly straightforward in tr uh, transition uh, transaction between an e-commerce and, and a customer. But what we've got here is a dozen or more system touch points needing data updates. So at any point given around this pr process, you've got somebody who's manually, usually manually entering data. Um, so you've got 12 points at which data could be manually entered incorrectly. It could be entered slowly uh, and all these sorts of things to in introduce delays. Uh, there's a chances for missed correct data, incorrect data. Um, with an automation process, you don't have to worry about the quality or availability of the data because it's all shared from a single point. So they're all sharing the same data um, with each other. And it's just to get you thinking about the fact that even on a simple prep process, like somebody placing an order on a website, there are a number of different systems that interact with that customer. So let's have a quick look at a couple of case studies. So Starlight is the first one. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of them, like I hadn't, they're um, one of the UK's leading dancewear wholesalers. But the process that they went through applies to pretty much any wholesaler or retailer, actually. Um, and their issue was, like most customers, um, they wanted to automate the repetitive manual processes that firstly introduced um, the, the possibility of errors. But secondly, a boring for, uh, for employees to undertake. They wanted to improve their customer experience and they wanted to find a solution that would grow with the business. Uh, what we ended up doing was we ended up automating their, their primary route to market, which was eBay. So we were automating stock updates for them. We were automating feedback responses. 
Um, and then all further back in the line, we're automating download of orders, pick list generation, um, and sending parcels out. Now, all of that has essentially eradicated manual input tasks. Um, they've made improvements in order processing efficiency. They deliver automated feedback through eBay now, um, and they integrate everything with Sage 200. So what they were interested in was, as they grow, do they get more staff or do they automate? And that was the question that they were dealing with. Um, essentially, they chose to automate. Um, and what they've received by automating is essentially a full time employee has been handed back to them to do other work uh, without them needing to hire anybody else. Because the person who is doing all of this work now doesn't have to. And that obviously offsets, off, offsets the cost um, of putting a system like this in. Second uh, customer case study for the light bulb group. Um, now, these guys create and produce fast growing product ranges to sell into retailers. So, anything that's cool or trendy, they're probably involved with it. Things like fidget spinners when they were when they were popular and, and these sorts of things that need to go to market quickly um, before they become unfashionable again. Um, and again, they were looking to integrate their three core business systems. Um, they were also looking to um, remove repetitive manual processes, but they also wanted to enhance their product development speed uh, and life cycles. Uh, we automated a whole load of bits and pieces, mainly driven by Sage 200. Um, they synchronized customer data between all their systems um, and were uploading product details and stock information into Salesforce so they could see in real time what was happening with their stock. Uh, because everything was siloed previously, they were having to enter different things into three different systems. Things were getting missed. Things weren't being updated as quickly as they wanted to. And what they found was that even though they'd chosen best of breed in each of the individual areas that they were, they, they were working with, so each of their core systems was best of breed, that didn't mean that they were all able to talk to each other and interact with each other properly without something like BPA being in the middle. Uh, and again, results were, you know, reducing manual processing, as you'd expect, improved the visibility of product availability throughout the business um, and a more flexible and full system integration. So before we look at the actual software, I just wanted to cover a piece about um, return on investment. Now, I'm used to in the past dealing with return on investment in a we pay John £10 an hour, John does this that does this process for three hours a day, that's £150 a week and multiplying it up to get your return on investment. But what we found talking to customers on this is it doesn't really work that way because although you automate, you probably still have John in the business and you're probably still paying him, otherwise he'd leave. So you're not replacing like for like. So the, 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 the return on investment didn't work calculating it in that way. But what we have looked at is calculating it and looking at it in different ways. And these six on here um, uh, are some of the ones we looked at. So in terms of opportunity cost, uh, what we're saying is, can we free up time for our staff to do something else? And that something else is typically stuff that people are good at. So talking to people, making decisions, being creative. Those are the people type things and leave the repetitive, mundane, data entry type stuff to an automated system that can cope with that without making errors and without getting bored. We mentioned earlier on audit trails. It's particularly relevant for um, compliance. We mentioned GDPR, things like that. But using an automated process gives you by default um, an audit trail of what's been done, when it's been done and how it's been done that you can reference. We've also got security. Um, if you use automation in place of manual process, you're eradicating sensitive data being exposed. And I mean in terms of writing it down, printing it out, taking a screenshot, copying data so that you can move it from system one to system two. Even to the extent of 
the old style automation where you would export a database to a CSV file and you would put that CSV file on the network somewhere so that it's available to other systems and then drag that file in somewhere else and update it. That still leaves you with potentially sensitive, personally identifiable information in an unsecured area on your network. So not ideal. Then you've got impacts. Um, and by impacts, we talk about the impact of something not being done. So if you missed something because it's a manual process and you forget or you skip over it, um, what is the impact of the business? Uh, a good example there was being if a let's say a, a PO isn't isn't in, a PO number isn't entered into an invoice that present prevents the invoice from being paid or at least gets it rejected when you send it back to the supplier. That means that you get paid late. That impacts cash flow. So we can see a return there as well. Standardization, um, you know, th this is a process that doesn't rely on somebody being around every day and is always carried out in the same way. So um, if you have one person doing, let's say, issuing licensing, if that person's off, how who fills in? How do they fill in? Do they do the same thing as the person who does it on a regular basis? Do they fill in all the necessary fields or do they just have a stab at it in the best way they can? So there's that element. And lastly, there's the reputation element. So this losing half a star of your eBay or your Amazon rating, uh, there's there's um, information around that, that's widely available that tells you that actually losing half a star from your eBay rating can cost you thousands of pounds because people don't want to deal with somebody who's got a lower rating on eBay or TripAdvisor or whatever it might be than somebody else. And that's a, a key driver for purchasing where they purchase these days. So there's that as well. Just a few different ways of measuring um, whether this is actually working for somebody or not. So let's have a look at the software and what it can do. So firstly, what can we integrate with? Now, this is a really useful slide for explaining what BPA is and what BPA does. BPA is middleware and it sits in the middle of your organization and it links up anything around the outer edges of this diagram. So whether that's ERP systems talking to CRM or ERP to e-commerce, um, we're also seeing a lot more now of um, things like MailChimp from a marketing perspective. We're doing a lot of courier integrations because that's been more difficult and it's become more challenging. So all of these things linked up and it's not just one to one, it's one to many. So you might have an ERP system, a CRM, some couriers, MailChimp, a couple of e-commerce platforms, uh, a payment gateway. You can link all of these things up with BPA. And what BPA is doing is essentially two things. It sits in the middle of your organization and it translates data from point A to point B so that both databases understand what's being asked of them. Um, and it does traffic management, so it does traffic direction. But that's a, that's a good one to look at to, uh, to get an understanding of the sorts of things that we're talking about integrating. Also got another slide. And I know that's fairly small. Hopefully you can see some of the things on there. A lot of these are um, ERP systems, CRM systems, e-commerce systems. But we've also got some some weird and wonderful things on there that we've integrated with before. Um, things like Twitter. Um, uh, we're being asked to integrate with WhatsApp now uh, that we're looking at. So as people are starting to work in different ways, we're being asked to integrate different systems. Um, you know, a few years ago, nobody would have expected anybody to want to integrate WhatsApp um, with an e-commerce system, but that's what's being asked for now. It's just the different ways that people integrate uh, or, or, or interact with the systems. So this is a very simple slide to explain BPA setup. BPA is um, a window it ba based on a Windows server and we can either deploy that on premises directly 
or we can provide it in um, a hosted environment. And we've had to do that because nowadays some people don't have servers on site. Five years ago, everybody had a server on site doing something. Um, nowadays, they might not. So typically, as I say, we've got all of these systems feeding into BPA. The BPA client has a set of tools that we'll look at in a second and a staging database typically. So what would happen is data would come from, let's say, an ERP system. It would be presented into BPA and placed into our staging database. We would then do some formatting and some changing of that data to make it understandable by the e-commerce system. And we would then send that data on. So that's typically what the system looks like and how it's set up. So in terms of um, the tools, the tools that we have create tasks and tasks are the bits of, uh, uh, task is the thing that does the actual data movement. So in terms of tools, we've, we've got event triggers. Now, typically we would do event triggering on a scheduled basis. Um, but we could do it on changes to a SQL or an Oracle database. We could do it on um, receipt of email. There's all kinds of things that can trigger um, a process or a task to run. We've then got connectors that can connect up to all of the things that we saw uh, on the previous slide and more besides. Essentially, we've got connectors. If your system or your database has an API, or it can export its data to CSV or an XML document, um, then we can connect to it and integrate with it. We can also do a mix and match environment. So if you've got old systems and new systems, we can do a bit of both. Um, although, as I say, the, 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 pr the preference would be um, not to use CSV, if at all possible, because of the security implications. We then do a little bit of formatting. Um, and we can format the data, we can change the file type, we can change how the data looks, we can change how it behaves. Um, anything we need to do essentially to make sure that the receiving database understands the data it's being presented with. And then we've got a couple of executables and general tools, things like decision processes. We've got a tool that can read PDFs and extract data from it. We've got a file management tool to allow you to save things places. So we've got all kinds of tools that are standardized within our software. Um, and the way we sell it, essentially all of these tools are available. So anything we talk about today uh, and anything we look at, it's not an optional extra, it's included in the, in the software. And as I say, these tools build up tasks. And tasks are essentially um, business processes or data flows. And they're your business processes or data flows. We don't dictate, um, so we don't have a set of, this is what you must do and this is how you must do it. Moreover, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what your business, business does and how it, how it does it. So what your business processes look like and then we use our tools to recreate that in an automated fashion. So we're not asking you to redesign how you operate your business. Um, we're just trying to automate what you're, exist what you're doing at the moment. Um, business functions such as stock alerts, um, integrating a web shop with your ERP, these are all business flows. So something like get new orders or update pricing, these would typically be a task. Um, Tasks can be really short, like the one on screen now. So three or four icons long, three or four different processes. But typically, they look a bit more like this. So there would be a number of um, steps within a task design. There would be con conversions of data. There would be some reading and writing from databases to create a task that does a specific business task. Uh, and the idea behind this is, and this is where Codeless comes in from Codeless platforms, is this is all designed to be um, click and drag um, and form filling rather than having to uh, know SQL coding. I don't know SQL coding. I, I, I you know, once they start talking SQL coding, I, I, I jump out of the, uh, the conversation pretty quickly because it's, it's not my thing, I don't get it. Um, but in a simple basic, 
what we do here is on the right hand side you can see some icons those are all then click and draggable so if you wanted to add a schedule to a task you would just click the schedule from the right hand side drag it into the design area and um, configure it in a graphical way that makes sense to anybody so you know i want this to go every x minutes um, on this day and so on and so forth much like any other scheduler um, if you've got techies around who like to do the sql coding up the top next to general and design you will see a script tab um, that scripting is a is, is access to a vb scripting tool where they can actually go in and do the sql coding if they want to but the idea of this was to make it a bit more user friendly so you didn't need to know how to do that sort of thing. The other thing to mention on here, um, and this goes in, in hand in hand with that, that coding beforehand, is that there is an area element of mapping that is required between um, the systems that we're using. Now, one person's Sage 200 may not look exactly the same as another person's Sage 200. You might have um, analysis codes or custom fields. So there is an element of bespoking to BPA, and that's in terms of both the mapping and also what we were looking at previously in terms of the business process setup. So there is some bespoking to be done, uh, although a lot of this stuff comes already made out of the box. What we typically do when we're connecting to APIs, we use the API of the product we're connecting to. So let's say Sage 200 on one side and an e-commerce system on the other. Those APIs make available a whole load of objects and you can work with any of those objects that you want to. So we're not restricting access to them. You get access to all of them. You can use whatever it is you need. So, um, so typically API driven, we can use flat files um, if we need to. Um, and the majority of this is off the shelf, but there will be a bit of tweaking depending on how your systems are set up and what you're doing with them. Another interesting point, um, we have a couple in our tool set, we have HTML and HTML Pro tools. Now, this gives you an idea of the sorts of dashboards that can be created using HTML Pro. I'm not going to go into HTML Pro in a lot of detail, but you know, just suffice to say, using HTML Pro tools on the data that we're pulling into and out of our system can give you a dashboard like this for information that you're particularly interested in tracking through the day, whether that be leads or sales or um, customer service queues or whatever it is you're looking at, you can do that with HTML Pro Tools. We've even we've also got um, HTML tools um, as part and parcel of our alerts and notifications. So you can use the system um, as we allu alluded to earlier. This is how the system started out life as a notification and alerting tool. So we can do all of these sorts of notifications. We can send them out by um, typically email, but we can do text as well, although there's additional cost involved in that for the text messaging service. We can set it up that way. Um, I've got a customer at the moment specifically looking to do text because their customer, their customer base doesn't typically use smartphones and isn't typically in the office. So we can do those sorts of things as well. And in terms of notifications and alerts, we've covered some of these, but you know, a retailer might want to do seasonal stock warnings or short shelf life, um, low stock levels. Uh, they might want to look at refrigeration servicing times, um, good shipping times, these sorts of things. Um, manufacturing customers might want to look at different things like back ordering, um, stock due not received, service reminders. All of these sorts of things. I mean, I've got one customer in the UK that has nine, nearly 900 different alerts configured for things that they want to know about every month. Um, and these fly around their business and they, they provide real, real value to them um, because they know that things don't have to be manually picked up. They're not going to be missed. So we've got that's the alerting and notification side of the software. We've also got the reporting and document, the documentation. So we can automate 
uh, a lot of the reporting that's available within CRM systems or ERP systems, whether that be credit control, um, waste reports, pick lists, delivery notes, what have you, these sorts of things are all available um, to be automated and delivered usually again by email to somebody who wants them. They don't have to remember to have to order them uh, or somebody have to kick them off. In terms of data and synchronization, this slide really harks back to um, the, the picture that we were looking at. And it's just to remind everybody that it's not just ERP and CRM. We can look at HR applications, inventory management tools, uh, all kinds of things. Couriers is, is, um, is a popular one at the moment. We've got DHL, DPD, FedEx, Hermes, um, which I don't think is called Hermes anymore. It's called something else. But we're also seeing a drive to things like Metapack and ShipStation, where you send in the details of what you want to send, and it looks up all of your pricing and says, actually, you're best off sending it via this courier on this service. And that all goes around the, the drive for reducing costs. We've also got um, something else that I haven't mentioned, which is workflow tools. Um, now, this was developed specifically for purchase order or per, per, purchase order authorizations, and it's the ability to run a task and then at some point within the task, step out, get human eyes on something, get them to approve it and then send it back into task and carry on depending on what they said. So you'll notice all of the things on here are authorizations, approvals, sign offs. Anything that somebody would have to look at, say, yes, I'm happy with that criteria, presses yes, presses no, the system carries on depending on what they press. So it's, it's just another way of running tasks um, that gives you a bit of flexibility if you have something that needs somebody to give it a yes or a no. So summing up all of those sorts of things, you've got retail business benefits, including removal of administration process, increased visibility, uh, critical business information, reduced operating costs, uh, reducing the need to recruit additional resource during peak periods. That's a really key one for, um, for retail because you've got peaks and troughs um, throughout the year. If you've got automation, that can be scaled up and scaled down very simply, whereas scaling up and scaling down people tends to be a bit more challenging. And always you've got this removal of human error element. Um, from a manufacturing perspective, we're getting rid of repetitive data entry, we're reducing customer response times, we're improving decision making. So it's all of these sorts of things that automation and integration can offer an organisation. So before we finish, I just wanted to cover very quickly something we've done very recently uh, with our friends, as I say, at Dracer, and that's Credit Hound alert packs. So uh, I would imagine that a lot of you have already heard of Credit Hound. Some of you probably use it. But one of the things that it's never had is the ability to alert and notify based on certain things. So whether that be credit limits, accounts on stock, disputes, whatever it might be. And what Dracer wanted to be able to offer here was something that could identify potential problems before they start eating away at profits, um, that they could remove employee time where employees were just looking for certain things to happen and then were notifying the business. They wanted something scalable, so something that could grow with the business and something that would save time and money. So customers can benefit from already having an application but it can be used much more in alerting and it can also then be the platform for any integration projects that you have because we're essentially using BPA to drive just the alerting side but it's sitting there in the background then so if the customer comes back and says I would like to do some sort of integration the core nuts and bolts for that facility already exist. A couple of the examples um, of the, the, the type of tasks that they've used on this. So um, firstly, getting notified as soon as new customers have been synchronized to Credit Hound. 
um, just making users aware in case they need to be adding them to a group or category and also removing the fact that they were loading into their system and they didn't know anything about it. Another one is putting um, so putting on stop. So if you get an alert, if a customer has been on stop, the system will automatically generate an alert for that. We can make you aware when payments for a transaction are made because um, we can use the Credit Hound diary reminders. Uh, we can issue notifications if a customer has exceeded their credit limits. Um, the other the other interesting one is the dispute one. So um, you can use this to be notified if, if outstanding transactions have been in dispute for a number of days, which you can vary. Um, you can then use that to follow up if they've been in, in, in dispute for X amount of weeks and use it as a reminder service so that things don't get forgotten and things don't get lost. Um, I think Credit Hound now have got 10 or 11 default alerts and notifications and the system has the ability to be scaled up, not maybe to 900 like what one of my other customers is using, but you know, if you had 20 or 30 different things that you wanted to monitor, the system has the ability to scale it. So it's just an interesting use case for something fairly new. So that's me. Um, if you want to know anything more about any of what we've discussed today, then please get in touch with your Innovate account manager. They'll be able to talk to you about quotes, about support, uh, demo requests. If you wanted to have a look at the software specifically um, to understand more about the nuts and bolts, we can do software demos, those sorts of things. Um, you can also have a look at our website at codelessplatforms.com if you want to uh, know anything more specifically about BPA. Um, we're going to open this up now, I think, to some questions. But before I go, I just wanted to mention, and I'll leave this one on here. If you haven't registered for the April event, for Innovate's April event, that's Sage 200 and what's new with Sage 200. Uh, and that's for next month. So with that, I shall um, open this up to, I think, Michael and some questions, hopefully. Appreciate that, Gary. Thank you very much. Is anybody here this Questions? Which invariably means you did a stunning job of answering everything in the presentation, Guy. A uh, quick oh, one for me. So. <laughs> A quick one from me then in that regard. So in terms of obviously people trying to identify these processes that they want to automate, what does that look like in terms of the next step? But, you know, do people need to kind of sit down with a piece of paper and kind of work it out? Or is that kind of part of the pre-sales consultation process? It's typically part of the pre-sales consultation process. So because there is an element of bespoking to BPA because of the changes you might have within your, your platforms or your processes, there's always a scoping exercise to undertake at the start. So people would, somebody, the customer would sit down with somebody from Innovate and would go through a scoping exercise to understand what processes they want to automate, what data they want to move around, where they want it placed and how they want it to be used. So yeah, there's all, there's always a, a collaboration element to the to the sale. Right. So there's an aspect straight away of if you've got something that you think you might want to be able to uh, automate and, and drive those processes, then uh, you know helps helps available from that very first step. Absolutely. Brilliant. Has any has anybody got anything else at this point? As I said, as as Guy mentioned, so uh, just to wrap up, um, thank you very much, Guy. That was really great. Um, so the 26th of April is our next uh, next event, which is about what's new in, with Sage 200 in 2022. Uh, so we're going to actually have some representation from Sage uh, to jump on that call uh, and guide us through some of those things. We're very uh, acutely aware that we've not had any in-person events for the last couple of years um, and so maybe people are not quite sure what's new in the software uh, there's just been a, a a new release as well as well of Sage 200 um, so there's plenty to be picking up on learning and that registration for that event is now open and we'll be confirming some bits uh, on, our, on our website but you can go ahead and register for that event if you so wish I know a number of people already have but uh, yeah, that's, that is everything from, from us for now um, and uh, appreciate you jumping on this morning and uh, 
hopefully we'll see you on our on our next event.